<laughs> Greetings, class, and welcome back to the CYSA Plus class. This is going to cover Chapter 3 on Malicious Activity and the First Domain of Security Operations. Let me get my screen going here, and we'll get started. Quite a lengthy discussion today. <clears throat> so, we're, again, we're going to cover uh, scenarios that would include malicious activities such as ransomware, malware, spyware, etc., and how to uh, appropriately appropriately use tools and techniques to determine that that malicious activity is actually going on and has been implanted in your system. So the first step is going to be analyzing network events. So this is all about monitoring your network and your systems. This comes from routers, uh, security appliances, log files, they're broken down into two main categories of active monitoring and passive monitoring, where uh, router-based monitoring basically relies on inputs from network infrastructure. It could not only be routers, but it could be switches. It could be um, security appliances, such as a firewall, intrusion prevention system, et cetera. And they're going to collect um, logs, basically, from NetFlow, uh, Armon, or remote monitoring, and simple network management protocol, as well as syslog data to boot. So a typical um, kind of broad general network topology, where you have the internet, a firewall, an IPS that could be sitting in between your main border router or layer three switch. This IPS could also be integrated inside the firewall, and then you have your distributed network. So they give a, an example of NetFlow data. NetFlow data is basically, um, think of it like Wireshark on steroids. So your network device collects all of the TCP, UDP, ICMP, Ethernet, all those strings of uh, communications between two IP addresses uh, and filters them basically, and then puts them into a readable package, a NetFlow, uh, that you can actually ascertain pertinent information from. So part of this is active monitoring. So they give a couple of examples, like a ping uh, or SNMP query, um, like a SNMP trap. Uh, NetFlow is more passive, uh, but and they also use the uh, example of iPerf. Whereas passive monitoring is where you're just going to be collecting data on an ongoing basis, like a NetFlow or a network tap. And you're basically going to take that information, throw it through a TCP dump, a Wireshark, or some other utility to analyze the traffic. So detecting common types of network issues, bandwidth consumption, unexpected traffic, uh, command and control beaconing. So a lot of what today's monitoring has come from has been in the realm of what we used to use as uh, network troubleshooting tools. So we would use all these tools, and these tools have been around for decades, uh, and we would use them to troubleshoot network problems, isolate issues with a network card or a specific switch port or a routing protocol misconfigurations, things like that. And these tools have always been good about collecting data. We're just using that data collection in another way and throwing it through a different type of application, a different lens, if you will, for security purposes. So we go through uh, bandwidth consumption. They give a couple of examples for using this. You can use SNMP data. You can use NetFlow data. NetFlow data is probably the best to use to analyze network uh, traffic network cons from a bandwidth consumption standpoint. And they list out PRTG, uh, which is a good network monitoring tool, not necessarily a security monitoring tool, but a good network monitoring tool. And then next they give an example of what beaconing looks like uh, in Wireshark and how um, you can use that to um, uh, analyze traffic for mental for malicious um, purposes. Now, the problem with that is this is a manual process and 
you can't monitor everything all the time, obviously. So we take this data and we put it through applications that will analyze it for us. And here's an example of unexpected traffic. Uh, IDS systems are good at analyzing this uh, because they're signature based. So if you have a packet that is caught with a uh, source and destination IP address that is the same, you know, that is going to throw a red flag. We can also monitor for denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks. Here, we are looking for a plethora of traffic to one specific port on an IP or one specific IP in, uh, in general that is going to try to flood the network and overpower the system and try to knock it offline. Detecting DOS and DDoS attacks is become pretty simple these days. Uh, you can look at performance monitoring. You can look at connection monitoring, network bandwidth. Uh, you can have dedicated tools that will pick this up in your intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. Uh, pretty easy to detect and also pretty easy to um, block. So you can basically call your ISP and say, hey, I think I'm having an attack against me and they can analyze it. And within minutes, they can block that traffic. Uh, as close to the source of the traffic as possible, which is what you want to do for a DOS attack. Now, if it's a DDoS attack and there's multiple source IPs, uh, that could be a little bit more challenging, but still uh, um, not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, probably the best folks at doing this um, is AWS or Azure or Google, uh, cloud service providers, because they really have tight control over their internet um, layer. So there's a good example of it, how, how a cloud-based provider mitigates a DDoS service. They do it within the, in the cloud itself, so it never, ever reaches you. Detecting other types of network attacks. Basically, you use an intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention system. You monitor your net flows, your SNMP data. Log feeds from your firewalls, routers, switches, servers, end devices, et cetera. Lots and lots and lots of logs. This is called log aggregation. You can feed that into what is called a SIM, Security Incident and Event Management um, Platform, to review and automatically alarm and even take action on the that traffic. So in investigating host-related issues, and this is probably one of the first steps in incident response, uh, looking at processor monitoring, memory, memory leaks, drive capacity, uh, file system changes, file integrity checks. Uh, and there's all kinds of tools that you can use. And they list out several there in a Linux system, PS, Top, DF, and W, which will help monitor memory, processes, disk space, etc. On the Windows side of the house, you can use Windows Resource Monitor. Again, this is at the end station. So this is practical for your home use if you have a Windows system. Okay, and it can even provide you with graphical monitoring over time. And you can save this. Now, this does take up a little bit of processor. Um, but if you think you're, you know, have a, a virus or malware on your system, this would be a first thing to look. Look at the processes that are taking up all your CPU or RAM um, or large files that might be eating up your disk space. Malware and malicious processes um, and unauthorized software can cause a lot of different problems. So in detecting malware and malicious processes, we can use antivirus, central management tools, software and file blacklisting, uh, application whitelisting. Uh, these can be done on system or off system as well. So we want to prevent unauthorized access changes and privileges or what I usually call max moves, adds and changes. Um, they list out different types here, the data that is logged, the location and the analysis tools that would be used for it. Another type of system that you can monitor for changes and anomalies is your registry in windows. So typically if the, um, a bad actor is going to plant a back door on your system, they will, it will have to have some sort of registry entry. And we can monitor new entries into the registry or changes to the registry 
um, especially anything that's related to group policy objects. And that can be a red flag and we can watch for that to make sure that no bad stuff is happening to our system. We can also monitor unauthorized scheduled tasks. We can tighten down the tasks that are being used with our scheduling manager, right? And make sure that it's not off, uh, not unauthorized. So looking at application related um, activity that could potentially be malicious, we're gonna monitor services, application logs, service anomaly detection, this can be done in both Windows and Linux through Windows Service Status and Linux Service Status, respectively. Application error monitoring. So if the application is created very robustly and can track error monitoring within itself, you should use it. And application behavior analysis. So run a baseline. Understand what the application, how the application is supposed to run versus if it is having issues in any way, shape, or form. So application and service monitoring can be up-down monitoring, performance, transactional, um, or just general application logging. If the if the application is set up with a robust logging um, uh, uh, service, you can go through almost every little step of the application and find out what's going on with it if something goes you know uh, off the rails. So non-security related problems. So this could be around performance, application service uh, specific errors or services that don't start on boot or don't start when expected or don't close down when expected and the failure of the service. Additional protection to this could be anti-malware, antivirus, file integrity checking. And I'm a big, huge fan of file integrity checking tools and whitelisting tools. So you can only allow what access to the application, what needs to have access to the application. So how do you detect attacks on applications? Well, the first step is to look for uh, anomalies uh, and just basically have a general understanding of, of the normal operating status of the application. If it goes, you know, and does something weird, for lack of a better technical term, uh, investigate it. Any introduction of new accounts that may not be authorized, any changes that are outside of a change control um, cycle, unexpected output, unexpected outbound communication, that's a big red flag. Service interruption and memory overflows, buffer overflows. This is more, the last one's more of a programming error that needs to be um, fixed through, you know, feature requests or, or, and or updates. Other indications of malicious activity, social engineering attacks, obfuscated links, uh, issues where the, the human factor comes into play, right? So that is the harder side to detect and fight back against. So training, uh, cyber hygiene, those types of things need to uh, of course, be done. So let's talk a little bit about the tools and we'll wrap up here for the day. So Wireshark is probably one of the biggest ones that's used in forensics. This can track the communication between two applications, between two hosts. And you can look for malicious activity there. It's almost like uh, looking for a needle in a haystack. It can be very, very, very tedious to go through. So this is why we like to use third-party applications to do that for us. But those third-party applications are only as good as uh, you know they're being programmed. TCP dump works in the same you know fashion as Wireshark, uh, except it's in Linux. And it's even more raw. It has even less analytical capability. A security inf information event management platform, which is really good to have if it is configured correctly, uh, can be very powerful, uh, especially for analysis. Uh, security orchestration, automation, and response tools or SOARs are used to integrate these tools and systems together. They rely on APIs, application program interfaces, and other types of methods to gather uh, security information 
from devices like logs, firewalls, vulnerability scanners, anti-malware, IDS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and even a SIM. The SOAR is going to rely on what we call playbooks to automate reactions uh, and take action against potential threatening um, activity. Endpoint security, our EDR, endpoint detection and response, are deployed to the endpoint system, your laptops, tablets, PCs, desktops, uh, even IoT devices potentially. They focus on identifying threat patterns. And basically what they do is they tell the system to just shut down or go offline or do something so that they do not threaten the network and spread uh, even further. Then there's DNS and IP reputation. So DNS is used to resolve IP addresses, of course, to host names. Who is is a tool that is used to do this. IP reputation services and domain reputation services like Abuse uh, PDB, uh, MX Toolbox, um, and others can basically help us to provide information uh, so that we don't go to malicious sites and flag sites that are malicious. File analysis and malware analysis, these are methods um, that are used at the command line uh, to extract strings um, and other human readable uh, information or from binary files to allow quick analysis. Virus tools um, and similar toolkits can be used to analyze potential malware. You want to use this in a sandbox environment where it is segregated from the rest of your network. So some examples of sandboxes might be Joe Sandbox, Sandbox or uh, Cuckoo Sandbox. So let's get into the last section here, I believe, which is on techniques. And this is going to look at patterns recognizing, pattern recognition, uh, to search for and identify common behaviors associated with malicious activity. This can help look at uh, or look for command and control services, i.e. beacons, behaviors, similar actions, and suspicious commands that are atypical of a threat actor taking um, action against your system or network. So uh, protecting and analyzing from Phishing, uh, analyzing email headers, email bodies, uh, email security options. Are you using encrypted uh, email? So email is probably one of the first lines of defense against bad actors who are using uh, spear phishing to try to get a user to click on a link or download a file or get a backdoor into the system. So here's an example of a header from a phishing email. We'll go into that because it's really hard to see. And the DMARC information for a syngrid.net, again, to kind of skip over that. And then file techniques, uh, our file analysis that can be, uh, take multiple forms from manual processes to hashing to of comparing files. Use behavior analysis looks at behaviors and compares them to baselines and expected behaviors. Once again, relying on pattern recognition to help identify malicious activity. And finally, the different types of programming language, uh, mostly scripting, uh, searching and text manipulation. So learn Bash, learn Python. Those are the two biggest ones that you really need to have or need to know for um, uh, quickly being able to uh, run an analysis of, say, a binary or script out uh, processes to uh, extract data from a uh, malicious uh, program or malicious email. There's all different types of uh, things you can do with those scripting languages. All right, so that is going to wrap it up for us today. And uh, we'll go over chapter four next time. So until then, I will bid you farewell and we'll see you around.